Today I want to address a topic that has given me a headache for a long time since I started running my home lab. Because when you set up any self-hosted services like a Proxmox server, a Nextcloud server or any other web application and you open it, your browser always warns you that your connection isn't private. And I know what most people will do now. Just click on advanced and proceed and hey, awesome, everything works, right? We could just move on and don't care about it anymore, right? Eh, not really. If you want to do it right and secure your web interfaces and applications in the network correctly, you should get your SSL certificates right. That's why in this video I want to explain what self-signed certificates are, why it's so important to configure them properly and how you can very easily do this in your internal network without Let's Encrypt, without any additional software and without the need for a public DNS name. Before we can do this and start generating self-signed certificates, let's also talk about SSL certificates in general and why we need them. I will try to make it short because we have a lot of stuff to cover today, so it might become a longer video, but some high-level understanding of SSL and TLS is absolutely necessary to know in IT and it is a perfect practice to learn it. By the way, if you'd like to learn more about topics like this, I might also do more videos in the future about network protocols and security, so why not subscribe to the channel and like the video, that would really help me out. Okay, back to SSL certificates. An SSL certificate is part of the TLS protocol and it has two main goals. So first is encrypting the connection and second validating trust between the client and the server. Both are vital for the secure web as we know it today. So without SSL certificates there wouldn't be HTTPS and you couldn't really secure browse any website. Today nearly all websites operate on the HTTPS protocol and are protected with SSL certificates. That's a good thing. You can see it in your browser when you open a website. So there you might have noticed a small lock icon in front of your address bar which tells you that the connection is secure. This also shows that the website is using an encryption with HTTPS and you can trust the issuer of the SSL certificate. To understand how this works, we need to first look inside an SSL certificate and find out what it contains. So SSL certificates are written in the so-called X509 standard. This is a format for defining public key certificates. All SSL certificates have a public key that the client can use to send encrypted messages to the server. If you have worked with public key cryptography before, for example in SSH, you might also know that this is called an asymmetric encryption. And there are always two parts to make this work. So the first the public key to encrypt messages and a corresponding private key to decrypt the messages. To be honest, I was never really good at cryptography, so that's not my favorite topic and we don't dive too deep into this. But what happens when a client opens a website is, the client will send a request to the server and the server will send its SSL certificate back to the client, which contains the public key. And then the client starts the TLS handshake process and sends the data encrypted with the server's public key. And because the server has a corresponding private key that belongs to this certificate, it can read the client's messages. But only the web server can decrypt the messages. And once the TLS handshake process is done, the client and the server agree on specific standards, they generate session keys and then finally can exchange the data. I know this is highly oversimplified. So technically the TLS handshake process is a bit more complex and there are some additional steps involved. Maybe I'll do a video about this at some point if you're interested in, but the main thing you need to remember from this tutorial is that the SSL certificate always contains a public key, which is shared with anyone who is connecting to the server and a corresponding private key that remains on the server to decrypt the client's messages. So this is the first important part of an SSL certificate, the public key. The second is a web server's identity. And this is important to validate the trust between the client and the server because we as a client we want to make sure that we are talking to the correct server. If we wouldn't validate the web server's identity someone in between could just hook into the connection and impersonate the web server by sending his own SSL certificate. Then our data is still encrypted but an attacker could read everything. This is also called a man in the middle attack in cybersecurity and that's why we include the server's identity in the SSL certificate because then the client can validate this information and decide if it trusts the server and ensure we are talking to the correct server and not somebody else like an attacker. This is very important for security but why does a client trust a public web server but not our internal web servers? 
And what exactly do we need to include in the web server's identity to tell the browser it should trust our certificates? Now let's look at how the client validates a website certificate. And there are a few parameters important for this validation. And if one of them is suspicious, the client notices, oh, there's something going wrong and presents you with a certificate warning. And we just go over some of the most important parameters you need to consider when creating self-signed certificates, just to keep it easy. The first important parameter is the target address. And this is described in the subject alternative names of the certificate. So when you inspect it, you can see it in the details. For example, on my website, you can see three subject alternative names, one for the main domain, the digitallife.com, one wildcard for this domain, which tells you that the certificate is valid for all subdomains as well, and the SNI cloudflare.com domain, which tells you this is a Cloudflare certificate. And the browser always compares what URL you are accessing, and it checks if it matches at least with one of these subject alternative names. The next is the expiry date because all certificates are just valid for a specific time period. So this is mainly for security reasons uh, that a certificate isn't valid forever and it is defined in a valid from and a valid to date. The third is the certificate chain and this is also very important because the browser always checks if the SSL certificate is issued by a CA that's included in the root store of the device. So don't worry, we'll go over this in some detail. You can inspect the certificate chain when you open the certification path. And this shows us that the certificate was issued by a so-called certificate authority, also just called CA. And the certificate authorities assign the underlying certificates to validate their ownership. So there are different types of CAs existing. There are root CAs, uh, usually at the top, and intermediate CAs in between. So the root CA issues the intermediate CA and the intermediate CA issues the SSL certificate. So that's why it is called a chain. And the browser always tries to validate this certificate chain by following the path back to the root CA to decide if it trusts it. And that should be the case for all public websites because if you are visiting a website, the certificate authority or also called just CA that signs this certificate is usually a public one. So a public CA. And there are many of these public CAs existing globally. Some of them are DigiCert, GlobalSign, GoDaddy and Let's Encrypt. And they sign and issue most of the SSL certificates on public websites today so public CAs can sign certificates for you that are trusted by any client. But again, the question is still, why does the client trust these public CAs? And the answer is pretty simple. It's because all these public CAs are stored on every device in every browser by default. For example, on Windows, you can inspect that in the trusted root CA store of the device. So here you can see all these trusted public CAs and they issue and sign all of the intermediate CAs, which then issue the SSL certificate that all public websites are using today. Okay, so you might now ask, why the hell do we do all this stuff here? So why even bother with self-signed certificates if we could just get an SSL certificate from Let's Encrypt entirely for free? And yeah, I usually don't use self-signed certificates on a public website or service. And I've already made some tutorials and videos about reverse proxies and how to get trusted SSL certificates from Let's Encrypt. But let me explain where the problem is in an internal network. Because in an internal network, you might not want this or it is even not possible. Possible. Because when you want to get a certificate from a public CA, there are some restrictions and requirements you have. Because again, these SSL certs are automatically trusted in every browser. Just imagine anyone could just get an SSL certificate for every domain in every IP address. That would be a big security problem. So that's why these public CAs always verify the ownership of the domain. You can only issue SSL certificates for a domain that is yours. So for example, if you buy a public domain like the digitallife.com, you validate the ownership, then you can get an SSL certificate from Let's Encrypt, for example. But this is then only valid for three months and it is only valid for the digitallife.com. Now let's assume you're running a bunch of self-hosted applications or services. For example, I'm running a Proxmox server in my home lab, which runs my virtual machines and it also has an administrative web UI protected with HTTPS. And my Proxmox server is listening on an internal IP address like 10.10.0.4. If I would now want to get rid of the certificate warning and obtain a trusted SSL certificate from Let's Encrypt, I would need a DNS name that points to this internal IP address and it needs to have my public domain, something like server.thedigitallife.com. 
And when a client in my internal network wants to open a connection to the server by using this domain name, I would need to somehow route this traffic to the internal IP address of my server, which might be tricky, but still possible. The bigger problem comes now, because I would also need to upload this SSL certificate onto the Proxmox web UI. So that means whenever the certificate becomes invalid, I would need to get a new one and I would need to re-upload it on the web UI. To be fair, there are many services and programs that support automatic certificate renewals by the implementation of the ACMA protocol, which can obtain and refresh these certificates from Let's Encrypt every three months. Proxmox also has this built in. But this is just one example and it might work for Proxmox, but of course I would need to do this for all of my internal services like my firewall, my storage server, everything that has an HTTPS protected web interface and it might not be supported by all the devices. So you can see it can get pretty complex and a lot of administrative work to do this. So let's now take a look at how that would work instead with self-signed certificates where we don't need all of this stuff. Because with self-signed certificates you can just pick any internal domain name. For example, I'm using steelcreative.home in my home network and I'm also using private IP addresses. And the client can then directly connect to these addresses by just using the internal DNS name or the IP address. That's much simpler. And to create a valid certificate chain, I'm using a private CA that signs this certificate and then I just need to upload this certificate on all of my servers once. The only thing that you would need to do now is, because the client also needs to trust the self-signed certificate is, you would need to upload the private CA into the trusted root CA store of all of your clients that need to access the web server's web UI. And I really mean on every client, so every PC, every laptop, every smartphone, whatever one to connect to our server, the CA that signs our certificate needs to be included in the trusted root CA store of that device. But in smaller networks like a home lab, it isn't so much work. And you just need to generate this certificate once, tell all your clients, hey, please trust this certificate authority, and then you're good. If you still want to access your servers from outside, you can, of course, use reverse proxies and certificates from Let's Encrypt. Or you can also use access proxies with two-factor authentication. And I quickly want to say a few words about Teleport, the sponsor of this video. So with Teleport, you can protect your remote resources like SSH Linux servers, Kubernetes, databases, or web applications with two-factor authentication authentication and an audit logging. It is entirely open source and free to use in the community edition and suppose you want to use it in your company environment and secure your development or operations teams. In that case Teleport also offers an enterprise version with additional 24-7 support and single sign-on. It's really a great application so just download and try it out. Of course you will find a link to their website in the description down below. I hope you are still with me. <laughs> Don't worry we are close now. So I hope it's clear why self-signed certificates make much sense for an internal network and how they generally work. Let, now let's create our own self-signed certificates that will be valid for all the clients in our internal network and this is actually much easier than you probably think. <laughs> to do this we will use the tool OpenSSL which is an open source implementation of the SSL and TLS protocols. You can by the way do much more with this tool but we will now use it to generate, inspect and validate SSL certificates. Usually this tool is installed on nearly all Linux distributions but if it isn't there you should be able to install this fairly easy through your package managers. And for the Windows guys just like me you can also do this entirely in PowerShell by the way. It doesn't really matter where you're using it but this is a very simple command line tool that you will need for many many other things as well. But it is no additional service that's running somewhere or some external service you need to rely on. By the way, you also don't need to write down any commands, so I've documented this all on my cheat sheets repository on GitHub because I can't remember all of this myself. So I, when I need to generate self-signed certificates, that's probably just a few times in a year. And then I can just go to my documentation pages and just copy and paste these commands. But still, let's go over them step by step because you should understand what you're doing here and not just blindly copy something from a tutorial. That's, that's never a good idea. Okay, so as you should know from the first part of this video, we need a certificate of 40 to issue our self-signed certificates. Let's start with this. So first we generate a new RSA key. So this is a private key of the CA cert that you should never share with anyone because whoever has control over this private key can generate new certificates signed with this CA. So that's why when we generate this key, we encrypt it with AES and use a passphrase because this is such a sensitive key. So make sure you're storing this passphrase later in a safe place because we always need it to generate and sign new certs. 
So a password manager might be a great idea. And we output this private key file to this file here, the cakey.pem. And I also generate my RSA certificates with uh, 4096 bits because they are more robust than the default encryption. And so when you execute this command, you also need to enter this passphrase. So let's do this. And the private key for the CA is now generated. And so we can now generate a corresponding CA certificate for this private key. And this command here will generate a new X509 certificate, which is valid for a specific time, which we define in days. So usually um, I pick a time that is longer than 15 years or so, because if the certificate expires, we would need to update it on every client that wants to connect to our servers. So, so just pick a long time. So we also need to input the CA's private key here, so, so that we've just generated and output this CA certificate into a file which is called ca.pem. So let's do this. So when you generate this cert, you also need to enter the passphrase and then you need to fill in some information about this certificate. So it's not really important what you enter here because this is mainly just for identifying the CA certificate later in the browser. So I will just uh, put in some generic information. And that's it. Certificate of 40 is created. So now you can check the information in your certificate if this is correct by using the OpenSSL tool. So we can use the X509 module and input this ca.pem file that we have generated and use the text parameter to view this in a human readable format. So um, this is a content of the file here. So everything between these lines. And when you scroll up, this is the format converted into human readable. So when you scroll up, you can see the details of this certificate. You can see the issue that this is our CA certificate. And you can also see that this is a CA certificate when you inspect the X509 V3 extension. So there is a specific parameter which is called CA column true. This is only there if the certificate is a certificate for a CA. Okay, great. So now that we have our CA, we can issue certificates for our servers with it. And for what server you create a cert now, that depends on what you want to do with it. So you can use this CA to generate a certificate for a specific DNS name that results to an IP address, something like proxmox.clcreative.home, whatever. And that's what I want to do now. But wildcard certificates or IP addresses are also possible. So you can issue one certificate with wildcard one that is valid for different subdomains and then you just need to issue this certificate once and you can use it on all the different servers when you're using subdomains in your DNS system. The important thing here is to generate certificates for the correct target address that you're entering in your browser. For example, when I'm using this for um, this address, I would need to enter the IP address or this entire network. But there are many different scenarios possible here. It just depends on your network and setup. The main important thing is that it shouldn't change later. Because when you change it, you might need to regenerate your certificates and re-upload them on your clients. So let's create our self-signed certificate by using this CA. So first we will start with generating an RSA key, a private key for our certificate, just like we did for the CA. The exception is that we don't need to protect this with a passphrase. So we don't encrypt it with AES. Because we later need to upload this uh, private key and the corresponding certificate on our server. And if you protect this securely, then it isn't a problem to generate this private key without a passphrase. I usually never do this. And let's output this into a different file name, which is called cert-key.pem and also use 4096 bits. So let's generate it. And the next command here will generate a certificate sign request. So we are not directly generating the SSL certificate here because it needs to be signed by our CA first. But at this point, we already need to set uh, the certificate uh, parameters correctly, like the hash and the target address, because otherwise the certificate won't be valid. So in the past, this subject name here was important to validate uh, the certificate, but now it isn't important anymore. So you can just put anything in here, your server name or whatever you like. So for example, I will just put in the creative here. That's totally fine. And we will also use the private key of our certificate that we've just generated and output this into a cert.csr file. So this is a file for our certificate sign request. 
Let's hit enter. So the important part of entering the correct DNS name or IP addresses comes now. Because before we create this final certificate, let's create a config file to set this correctly. The parameter we need to set here is the subject alternative names, just we have inspected in the certificates. And you can do this by entering specific DNS names that resolves to the IP addresses in your internal network, or you can also use IP addresses. For example, I want to generate this certificate, which is valid for this IP address, but I would also like to enter a DNS name if I want to change that later. For example, let's input a wildcard for clcreative.com, which can resolve to my Proxmox server. But I want also to include this IP address here. Uh, let's check. Oh no, it was the four. And we put this content basically in a file, which is called extfile.cnf. And uh, when we inspect it, you can see it's just the content in the file here. Okay, so now let's generate this certificate from the certificate signed request. And we just use the X509 module of the OpenSSL tool and issue a new certificate with this hash that is valid for a specific time. So now we can also put a longer time in here, for example, Let's add a zero and we input our certificate sign request here. So cert.csr that we've just generated. And we also need to include the certificate of 40 cert here. So the ca.pem and the ca key as well and output this into our cert.pem file. So this will be the file for the SSL certificate. We also need to include the ext file. So the xfile.cnf where we have defined the subject alternative names and add the parameter ca create serial. So this is important when you're issuing more than one certificate to add a serial number that is increasing. So let's hit enter. And now we need to enter the passphrase for the certificate of 40's private key. And that's it, our SSL certificate is generated. So now we have a few different files in this project folder. So we have the CA key, the private key of the certificate of 40, the certificate of 40's certificate. Oh man, <laughs> I just get confused here. And the certificate private key, the signed request we don't need anymore and the certificate. But we are not finished yet. Remember when we talked about the certificate chain and how the client validates the certificate? So we need to combine both of these uh, certificate files, the ca.pem and the cert.pem into one single full chain certificate file. And it might sound like another complicated thing, but it's just actually put both files together in one. So you can just use the cut command to put the output of the cert.pem file into a new file, which is called fullchain.pem, and then just cut the output of the cacert.pem file and add it to this file. So it's actually just both files combined to one. And on my Proxmox server's web interface, there's also a menu for importing our SSL certificates. So uh, when we go to certificates here, we can upload a custom certificate. And now we just need to put the private key in here. So we just need to copy the output of the third key.pem. So just copy it. And the output of our certificate chain. So put it here and upload it. And when we reload the page, you can also inspect the certificate. This is our generated SSL certificate. But you can see the connection is still not trusted because our Windows client or the browser does not trust our CA that we've generated. And this is because we haven't imported it in the trusted root certification authority store. And this is also very simple. So on my cheat sheet repository, I've documented how to do this on the different clients. You can do this on Linux. You can also do this on Windows or on your smartphones like Android and iOS, for example. So on Windows, it's actually pretty simple. You just need to execute this command here in the PowerShell. So let's just do this and import it. Oh, I probably need to do this with administrator privileges. And now it is imported. You can also inspect the root CA store. So let's check if this is really there. So when we go in here, you can also see here is our CA that we've just imported. Okay. So sometimes you need to close the browser and reload it again. But now you can see the connection is trusted. And when we click on this icon, you can see the connection is secure and their certificate is valid because when we go to the certification path, 
The client now trusts our CACL creative, which we have just generated and imported into the Trusted Root CA store. Okay, so I know that was a lot and you might take some time to rewatch this video and follow some of the steps by looking into my cheat sheets repository on GitHub, but that's totally fine. I think getting those CA certs into the Trusted Root CA store is probably the most annoying task because you need to do this on every single client in your network. And I've already thought about automating this process. So for example, I've written a short PowerShell script that will do this entirely on my Windows clients. Or you could also think about integrating the CA cert into any VM images or using tools like Terraform or Ansible. For mobile devices, I haven't really found a great solution here, unfortunately. So you probably need to do that on every phone that you're using manually. But if you generate a certificate authority that is valid for a very long time, you only need to do that once and then you can still issue new certificates for different services later. The client still will trust these new certificates because they were issued by the same CA that you already imported before. So I hope this helps you in your home lab and in your internal network to get rid of any certificate warning and you could also learn something useful. And as always, thanks to everybody for watching. I will catch you in the next video. Take care. Bye bye.